All right, welcome back. Uh, my name is Kenji Gimura. Uh, today we'll talk about health information exchange, and this video is specifically referencing the Clinical Informatics Study Guide 2nd edition by Dr. Fennell and Dr. Dixon, Chapter 14. Uh, I try to condense the chapter and try to pick up what's the most important uh, theme of this uh, chapter. And if you find it uh, interesting, uh, please read this chapter. And I made extra slides, but I'm not going to go through all of them in this video. So if you want to uh, dive deeper, you could download the, this PowerPoint and then uh, look at the other slides as well. All right, so let's jump in. All right, starting with the introduction, uh, we all know how complicated medical data is, and trying to share that is even more complicated, especially with out-of-network. Uh, HIE interoperability aims for uh, universal data sharing, uh, but U.S. lacks comprehensive HIE, and COVID really highlighted that. So in this chapter, we're going to explore HIE challenges and try to think about what we could do as a clinical informatician. So what is the difference between interoperability uh, versus health information exchange? Um, basically, health information exchange is a bigger umbrella term and interoperability is a subset of HIE. Uh, interoperability is where you send a patient's information to another hospital and then they are able to seamlessly integrate it into their uh, electronic medical record system as well. EMR as well. So let's say you want to send the CBC to the other hospital. You just push it, send it, and then it should populate in their CBC uh, part of their data structure. Versus HIE, that's also part of it. Interoperability is part of HIE. But if you just simply print the CBC and then fax it to the other hospital, that's still considered HIE. So Health information exchange is an umbrella term. Interoperability is like the uh, gold that we want to uh, achieve, the gold standard that we want to achieve. This is just the, uh, the difference between the HIE versus interoperability that I added from the book. So interoperability and HIE in medicine. Uh, HIE has three primary uh, components, uh, query, sending, and receiving which you would think that that's obvious, that you're trying to exchange information between the two hospitals. You want to be able to do these queries, sending, and receiving. That's, that sounds very obvious, but actually that's not the case in reality. Uh, oftentimes, uh, some hospitals are able to send but not receive. Receive but not able to send. They're able to or not able to query. So oftentimes, uh, a hospital has to be kind of uh, registered or subscribed to these services that are able to send, receive, and query, um, which I'm going to go into next. So the Health Information Exchange Network is kind of like a third-party organization um, that helps in this exchange, uh, receive, send, and query. Um, HIE hinges on governance and technology, and these third-party HIE systems or network is just sometimes called HIE or HIO, which stands for Health Information Organization, Exchange Organization, I guess. Um, so there's various kinds of HIE networks. Maybe some of them works on receiving, one of them works on querying, one of them works on sending, such as that. So a hospital system might have to, to, uh, to subscribe to multiple HIE networks to make sure that they're able to communicate smoothly between each other. So a brief history of HIE, as in brief, basically, we were not successful so far. The High Tech Act uh, propelled the current HIE era, but we're far behind a smooth interoperability. And this is just to give you a big concept and idea about what kind of HIE networks there are. There's a private, the state government facilitated HIE, community-based vendor and national network frameworks. I made more detailed slides for each one, but here I'm going to just uh, quickly point out each one. Private HIE is where, uh, for example, you have a specific patient population that you're serving. And the big example, the main example, uh, the most common example, is the VA. So you're serving uh, the veterans 
and um, the whole network, the Veterans Hospital, are connected to each other. So wherever your patient goes, uh, the vet veterans information is uh, able to be pulled from wherever because those hospitals are connected and they communicate to each other. Uh, now, state government facilitated HIE. Uh, since the High Tech Act, the state has to assign a HIE organization um, that coordinates this, uh, the exchange between hospitals. So now this uh, framework or this uh, type of HIE is where the state is helping out with the uh, exchange. However, this doesn't mean that the state holds the information, it just facilitates the exchange of the information and it doesn't store it within themselves. The community-based one is within a smaller community. Uh, there's multiple hospitals, but they, they basically uh, can't shake hands that they're going to trade information because they're serving a very similar population and they don't want to do redundant testing. And vendor facilitated is say like if you are using Epic and in another hospital is using Epic, through Epic, the vendor, uh, you are able to exchange. But sometimes this is this could be a little bit, uh, you would think that that's obvious, but actually maybe you might have to pay a service fee for this. So it, it's not necessarily that everybody is subscribed to this vendor facilitated HIE, even if you are using the same vendor for your EMR. And then national network framework is, let me just show you a picture for this one. Uh, so uh, national network framework here, just to look at the diagram makes it easier to understand. So if each state is uh, organizing the health information exchange or community is or these smaller networks, there has to be a network that connects the network. And that's what the attempt of the National Network Framework is. Um, the 21st Century Cures Act initiated the development of the TEFCA in the U.S. to promote nation, uh, nationwide information exchange. TEFCA is part of the 21st Century Cures Act to connect uh, the networks. And one of their uh, projects that they're going working on is the RCE, the Recognized Coordinating Entity, which is the Sequoia project that oversees all these uh, individual networks and the networks that are connecting within networks. And each network consists of federal agency or healthcare systems or uh, HIE vendors, various networks. But the big idea is that the national network uh, the RCE is basically working on connecting networks within networks. So that's a little complicated because there's so many individual networks that now, that now we need to connect the networks. So which type of HIE network is best for you or your hospital? It depends what kind of population you're serving. Uh, is it a community hospital? Is the people you are working with closely, are they using the same EMR system, same vendor? Uh, these are some questions to think about when you are choosing what kind of HIE network you want to use. And how is the adoption of HIE in the United States? This is a little bit harder to measure. Um, it depends on the technological capabilities. Um, and uh, how far and how extensive these HIE systems are. Uh, but for one thing for sure is that we're behind the high technical goal that uh, HIE um, should be for the United States. Our communication is not as smooth between hospitals. And this proves that fact. Uh, you could read the right hand side of the slide later, uh, but basically um, the government uh, came up with four variables to measure the adoption of HIE. That is to, are you able to send, receive, query, and integrate? So these are the questions that they asked to each um, institutions, and they got this result back. So in 2014, uh, the black line is to be able to send. So 77% was able to send information to another hospital. 55% were able to receive it, 48% were able to find it, as in query it, and 40% were able to integrate it. I don't know exactly what they mean by integrate here, 
um, integrate sounds like you know you send the CBC and it populates into the other person's other hospitals EMR as a CBC as well versus is it a CBC lab result that is just printed out and then PDF is just scanned into the other side's EMR is considered integrated? Um, in my definition, I don't think that's considered truly integrated because um, it's just you're scanning a document in there. But um, perhaps that counts. But anyway, the integrate is the lowest and it's 40%. And this 23% is if you are able to do all four of this and in very small population uh, institution were able to do all four of it. And 2018, 45% were able to do uh, all four of it, but still, you know, it's less than half. Maybe it's half of the institutions in the United States are able to do uh, for all four of these um, variables. So there's a lot to work on. So what are the drivers of adoption? There's technical, financial, political uh, factors. Um, some join HIE for vendor simplification, uh, just to be able to communicate smoother. If you're if that hospital is using ven uh, vendor A, you might as well use vendor A as well. Uh, urban centers are uh, more abundant with IT resources, so they get to they tend to adapt first to this HIE exchange. Um, platforms. Um, policies are pushing it and tech investment boosts HIE participations and I think you could imagine that. And what are some barriers? So there's technical barriers. Uh, EHR itself, I, obviously we know that it's a very vast and customizable component makes it even harder to actually exchange. There's thousands of data field. Uh, HL7 and FHIR standards are being uh, developed and being uh, used more frequently. However, uh, you have to think about, uh, you have to keep updating the uh, your system and with the vendor. So the vendor and your local hospital has to be able to communicate well and understand HL7 and FHIR well and keep uh, the maintenance up to date. Another problem, uh, particularly in the United States, is that we don't have a national identifier. So sometimes I, uh, person A in one hospital system uh, and person once that person transferred to hospital another hospital uh, they have to make sure that they indeed received that person's medical record data and sometimes this is technically challenging uh, because we don't have a um, national patient identifier um, and inconsistent demographic data and data structure complicates uh, many challenges, many exchanges. How about in terms of workflow? Is there barriers in workflow? Of course there is. Um, so HIE uh, could be a separate platform from your main EMR, which makes it very um, time consuming for physicians. You have to log into another um, exchange platform to be able to see the uh, data from outside. Maybe there's uh, very overlapping uh, overlapping data within the HIE uh, platform as well. So you're going through EMR, your local hospital EMR, and you notice that you're missing some data. You try to go into the e, um, HIE network, you log in there, but you see a lot of the similar data as what you already have at your home. So now you have to go through the HIE system, the network, and try to find that specific data that you're looking for. So then it takes time um, for the physicians and sometimes we might be reluctant to go through all the data, it just it takes too much time. So you would just rather order the data, order the test again. So then that could cause a duplication of uh, redundant tests. Um, it would be easier if your HIE is directly incorporated into the EMR. That way the physicians or user doesn't have to uh, log into another system to just look at a certain part of the medical record. And yeah, data overload, like I said, uh, just being overloaded by so much data from your EMR and your HIE system could be overwhelming for the physicians and not be able to organize the true data that they're looking for. And maybe sometimes the radiology image, they want to see the radiology image from outside the hospital, but the quality is bad. 
So uh, you might as well just order another one. So these are some workflow issues that we need to still work on as well. And financial barriers, uh, there's direct cost, obviously, of maintaining these HIE systems. Um, EHR vendors uh, also um, might ask for, uh, might require extra costs to use their vendor solution for HIE. And community hospitals, uh, they initially got the High Tech Act uh, grant to incorporate the EMR into their system, but those uh, money and funds uh, have already ran out, and now they, it's up to them to maintain the EMR and HIE system. So uh, financial uh, strength, restraints are uh, there, especially for smaller hospitals. Um, and some incentives, uh, some hospital, this is illegal now, but obviously uh, information blocking because data is such a uh, important source, it's, it's considered there, it's a co competitive edge for the hospital to have that patient's data. So there might be an incentive to um, block it as in uh, kind of uh, hide the information from other hospitals. Now it's illegal uh, to do that, but there's not a great incentive placed as well. And I'm not sure how uh, much the government is overlooking and um, con uh, make sure that that doesn't happen, make sure that information blocking is not happening. So these are some uh, potential barriers still. Um, yeah, so uh, existing reimbursement system fee for service uh, does this and this incentivizes provider because uh, the more you order the test, the more you get reimbursed. Then why would you go into HIE and check if that test was already ordered? You might as well just order it again at your home institution and then uh, get reimbursed. So there's a less incentive for. Uh, the practitioners in that sense as well. Uh, to so for summer to summarize this, uh, the present problem and future solutions um, to improve HIE adoption, we need to have a unified uh, standard uh, such as Fire or HL7, and have an API-based exchange platform um, and seamless integration from outside uh, data. Uh, seamlessly integrated into the physician's workflow and a uh, policy around uh, if it's if the uh, institution is blocking uh, data then there should be a penalty and to re um, actually uh, reinforce that or incentivize uh, to use health information exchange becomes important um, and this takes a lot of leadership and collaboration between institutions and um, it is something that we need to work on. Um, again, API, uh, just one emerging trend um, is that API interoperability, particularly using Fire, is being developed and adopted. Uh, it, it's still um, not every all, not all institutions are using it yet, especially the smaller hospitals, but larger healthcare systems are adopting it uh, very quickly. And uh, these, larger healthcare systems are developing the uh, application ecosystem. So in summary, uh, interoperability in HIE is crucial for comprehensive patient care. Uh, data itself is fragmented, so we do need HIE solutions, but HIE itself might have to be also connected between each other as well. So there might need a necessity for a larger network to connect the smaller networks. Barriers that we talked about are some, some of them are technical, uh, workflow, uh, financial barriers, and some political uh, policies issues as well. And solutions that are coming up are API and FHIR and HL7 for smoother interoperability. So that wraps up this video. I hope it was helpful and kind of gave you the big picture of what HIE system is. And I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.